All right, Foot Clan, we got a coaching changes episode. We're breaking down new head coaches, new offensive coordinators, the implications for fantasy. Don't miss this episode. Kill! Oh, Foot Clan, that's right. That's pre-order pricing still available for the ultimate draft kit. This fantasy football season is going to be the best fantasy football season, and you're going to attack your league mates, metaphorically speaking, <laughs> through the ultimate draft kit. Check it out at ultimatedraftkit.com. You won't be disappointed. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. that, was, that was the sound of a man falling off of a cliff from a mile away. Yes, I thought I heard it at first, then it was gone quickly. But in addition to that, not only did we not only did we get the treat of Andy trying to come in strong and just falling off a cliff, but Mike, your laugh was brought to a different level at that point. I don't know if was, you know what you did. I it was, it so was good. very funny. But that lady found it super funny. <laughs> Thursday, March twelfth. I got a message from Jason right before the show started. It said it's going to be a wild one. I know it will be. We're we a, have. We're in a mood today. <laughs> we are. I don't know what it is. We're well fed. That's true. Well enough. Mike tried to steal most of Jason's lunch for about 20 minutes. Tried. Did you get Successful. it? Successful. Oh, you got the I rest of I eventually guilted him into giving me half the same Really? And that's not something easy to do with No, me. it's not. It was a, an a, achievement was unlocked. Did you have another sandwich somewhere? Yeah, it's in my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> we have actually a very important, very exciting show today. Coaching changes. We're going to walk through the different head coaching, offensive coordinator changes around the NFL. Some pretty interesting data to look at. Looking back at last year, all the changes that were made. And uh, it's going to be fun. It's going to be a good time. We've got some news to get into. Quick question today. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. We appreciate all the subscribes the reviews apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify wherever you're listening it's gonna be a fun off season we got free agency coming soon another team wants tom brady each and every day i believe it is the buccaneers today yeah they're gonna they're gonna try to get him everyone wants to build a franchise around a 43 year old quarterback yeah it's how you you want a strong foundation for the future. What could possibly go wrong? I believe that they did a quick poll in San Francisco when San Francisco was at the top of the rumor mill, mm -hmm. and uh, they polled, you know, the ra local radio shows polled, who do you want for this upcoming year? Do you want Jimmy Garoppolo? you want Tom Brady? What do you think those poll results came in at? 60-40 Garoppolo. It was like 85-15 Garoppolo. Okay. Oh, good. Good for you, Because they Fred. want to survive beyond one year. That's fantastic news because I was I thought you were going to say the city turned on him. Look, they it, lost the Super Bowl. I was say, they were in the Super Bowl, right? Like, man, we don't. What a bum. We don't need him. Yeah, I feel like people almost did that on golf last year in the Super Bowl. So it can happen if you if when you sign was perfectly fine. This sure. Year. If you went, if when you signed Tom Brady, you also received the championship for the upcoming year, it would be a different story. Hundred percent worth it. That's true. More valuable in that situation. All right, I have a quick question before we get things started. This one comes in from Luke on Twitter. Hey, guys, I was given commissioner duties in my home league. People have wanted certain rule changes for quite some time. I decided to put each rule change up to vote. Good job. Should I do majority wins or do they have to be unanimous? Mm. Um, or does it depend on the rule? That's the answer. Yeah, it does. Well, I don't think... I answered the quick question quickly. With the quick questions question. Yes. Um, of uh, Does it depend on the rule? Yes. I would also add to that it depends on the time of year. Um, this is a great time of year. And I would, I would argue that most of all of your commissioner questions that you're going to put to a vote, I just want simple majority. I don't think you need to have it unanimous. If more of half, more than half of the league wants to switch to fab or switch to PPR or get rid of kickers, which they should all want, um, then that's all you need. If more than half wants it, then that's what you know, you should change. If it's something like adding keepers, 
that has roster implications, that's when I look for a unanimous vote. You don't want to put the league in the position where, okay, you're going to convert to a keeper league uh, with existing rosters, but then, you know, 40% of the league doesn't want to do that because right. that – that can make a more difficult situation. So the best goal there is to try to find something that works for everybody. Well, that's where I say it's it's not so much a matter of which rule, but when. So if you're voting for keepers and half more than half the league wants it, but it's not unanimous, you shouldn't ever put keepers in place based After on last draft. year's roster Correct. or this Unless year's it's roster. Unanimous. If you want to do it with a unanimous, unanimous vote, that's fine. Yeah, if everybody's involved, but otherwise you didn't draft knowing that that rule would be there, and, and so then you just say, we're going to be a keeper league after this year. What do, I mean, this sounds stupid because I'm the commissioner of our main league. Don't we do a 70-30 situation? I don't believe so. We don't do, just do straight majority. I, Not on every rule. I no, we, so. we would have lost kickers a long time ago. Yeah, we, we do a super majority. Yeah, super majority. So for a 12-man league, we, we said, what, eight? It has to be at least eight. Yeah. So based on that, if, if that's the case, um, it seems like you should just do simple majority because you said we would have lost kickers long ago. True. Yes, don't look backwards. Mm -hmm. Look forwards, Jason. Okay. All right, let's talk news. News and notes from around the league. By the way, we do have a Keenan Allen signed jersey we're giving away at FootClanGiveaway.com. Make sure you check that out. Free agency next week. You guys excited? I am. And like mostly because of the quarterbacks. Yeah. Like this is I I can't remember a year ever like this. I mean, occasionally from time to time there is a there is one prize. There is one guy like the, the Kirk Pey Cousins year, the the Peyton Manning year, the Kirk Cousins year. It was who's going to get the one quarterback. I mean, there are massive implications. Yeah, the reason you can't remember it being like this year is because it's literally never happened. Not only do you have the greatest quarterback of all time up for grabs uh, at, in a in a in his young age, right, forty three, um, but you've got Philip Rivers and Jameis Winston and serviceable guys like Teddy Bridgewater Tannehill. and Ryan Tan. It's it's absurd. It's going to be it. very interesting. Monday, teams are permitted to enter contract negotiations. The league year, free agency begins on Wednesday. Both of those situations are going to take place after we have a vote on the new collective bargaining agreement, which should be completed by this weekend. Correct. And then that will have some implications as well because if they go into the new league year with the new CBA, there's different rules about – franchising and transition uh, tagging players so that will that will also affect things speaking about the Brady to Tampa Bay situation I think that unlike a team like maybe Tennessee who if you believe in Ryan Tannehill long term you know you're sacrificing it's like the Garoppolo situation you're sacrificing a lot of the future for one shot with Brady maybe two with Brady who had his worst statistical season in a long time last year albeit walking into Godwin and Evans and Arians and that situation could be great. But for the Buccaneers, it makes more sense to me because yes, it, it I does. don't believe that Jameis Winston is the future of the franchise. And if you don't believe that and you're actually kicking the tires on Phillip Rivers, I'd rather have Tom Brady than Phillip Rivers for my one- or two-year window. Yeah, you're looking for a bridge quarterback. So Brady to the Bucks does make a lot of sense. A bridge water? Ooh. Oh. Man, well, if you're signing bridge water, you're hoping he's the future. That's true. I mean, uh, Bruce Arians didn't come for a rebuild. He's, I still believe, the oldest coach in the league. He's got three or four years left. He is wants. That, is he older than Pete? Uh, oh, maybe. I'll maybe look it up. Pete, uh, but as one of those two guys, the point is he's not looking for a ten-year, you know, rebuild. He wants to win now. Obviously, Tom Brady helps him do that. The the thing that I just find interesting and like a not a fit is that both Bridgewater, who's rumored there, and Brady. They don't throw the ball downfield as much, and Bruce Arians is a, you know, deep passing, move the ball down the field, uh, aggressive mindset that just doesn't strike me as a fit for Brady or Bridgewater. Pete Carroll is older, just for <laughs> what a loser. He doesn't act it. No, no, no all I mean, that bubble I, gum I, keeps if, you young. I really, genuinely want to be like Pete Carroll when I am his age, if. It, I ever get there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that, that got dark. I got a little morbid. I, I, I eat too many backpack sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ryan Tannehill, uh, Ian Rappaport talking about the Titans focused on re-signing him. 
I think that Jameis is all but gone from Tampa, so that'll be interesting who's interested in him. Could it be someone like Chicago? Could it be Indianapolis? Is somebody going to give him a starting opportunity, or is he going to walk into a situation like Tannehill did, trying to identify a team with a weak starting situation that he could take over for? That'll be interesting. So, any other news you guys want to talk about before we get into the coaching changes? We have a lot to talk about there. ton of coaching change uh, changes happening this year. I've been looking forward to this show. I say let's get after it. I'd say the, the, the oddest piece of news that I heard recently was uh, it's being reported from the Houston Chronicle that Carlos Hyde declined a contract offer from the Texans. I think <laughs> that's a bad move, Carlos. Like, like it's One, it's interesting to me because Houston has been – Kind of a uh, a hot topic. Of, like it's a hot destination that we want to put one of the great rookies, one of the like Melvin Gordon goes to Houston because he becomes very fantasy relevant. Carlos Hyde. Earlier it tells me in this, it was a terrible offer. That's what that tells me. Oh no, me. I I know it was terrible. It, but I mean, Carlos but it was one. That's exactly the point. Is Carlos Hyde? Will he really get another offer? Probably. I mean, has he seen what happens to running backs? No. He he hasn't. He comes from the lineage of the Frank Gore tree, where they are eternal. It's he true. he, he was behind Frank Gore. I know. Let's talk coaches. Coaching carousel. All right, this is a fun time of year because. We know that the impact of coaching changes, offensive system changes, offensive coordinator shakeups can have a very big impact on fantasy. There is, I believe, a tendency to look through rose-colored glasses, potentially, at all of the changes. It's got to be better than the year before. Uh, in 2019, last year, we had eight new head coaches. We had 16 new offensive coordinators. Out of those 16 changes... When you look at how these teams finished in terms of total points scored, the offensive side of the football, seven of those changes got worse, not better. So I think that's a good reminder that everything is not going to improve just because you make a change. Yeah, and by getting worse, you mean in uh, points scored per game. I do, yeah, by so that offensively. metric. Offensively. Offensively, it, it was not a great situation for some of these players or for some of these coaches. And so as we look at all the changes that take place heading into 2020, you know, our objective is to break down what these coaches are bringing to the table, possible players that will benefit from those changes. Tendencies. Play, yeah, tendencies. Players that will suffer under uh, philosophical changes in the offense. And I think there's some interesting ones on that side. But that's kind of what we're looking at. So heading into 2020, who do you want to start with? Let's just start with the murder. Oh, oh, murder. Uh, the Carolina Panthers bring in a, a pair of young guns. They've got Ja Rule replacing no, no, Ron no, no, Rivera. No, Matt, it's, it's Matt Rule. It's Matt Ja Rule. Yeah, Matt. Oh, is, I'm sorry. I just I'm call sorry. him by his nickname, Ja. Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, that's a short form of Matt. Got that it. is right. Ja for Matt. Um, but Ja Rule replacing <laughs> Ron Rivera as the head coach for... The Carolina Panthers, he was heavily sought after. It seemed like he was going to go to the Giants. And, you know, a lot of people wanted him. Uh, the The prize went to the Carolina Panthers. And then he, then in his search, went out and find an uh, found an offensive coordinator he wanted um, who is, I mean, you know, Ja Rule is young in and of himself. Uh, but his offensive coordinator here is a 30-year-old uh, Joe Brady who – I mean, he he wasn't a former NFL player. Uh, he spent two years in 2017 and 2018 with the Saints. Uh, so great offense, uh, Sean Payton and Drew Brees. And then last year was the LSU passing game kind of offensive coordinator uh, in charge of totally basically rebranding the offense of LSU and winning the national championship with Joe Burrow. But, you, you know, so some of it is, well, he had Joe Burrow. And he had Drew Brees. We've seen a lot. That of, helps. That that's going to help your yeah. offense. But at the same time, he's a. Th I'm really excited about him. I I think he's a, th a. He's 30 years old. He's an offensive coordinator now in the NFL, um, and comes from success. Okay, but I I, I think <laughs> I think what a lot of fantasy owners want to know first. Let's put this at the top of the list. 
Well, I think there's two big things in Carolina is, are you going to get consistent quarterback play out of Cam Newton? And did we see, regardless of the coaching change, look, nobody sings the praises of North Turner and the one-back dedicated offense than you, Jason, with what that brought to the table for Christian McCaffrey, 403 touches last year. And that's kind of something that you look at and say, regardless of the change, that's a peak number for a player. Uh, you know, since 2000, there have been 19 different running backs that had 400 plus touch seasons. The year after, those running backs averaged 352 touches and lost an average of 86 touches. You could have been fearful about McCaffrey going into uh, this past year where he dominated because of the injury to Cam Newton or the tumult on the team and the fact that they were a, a, a franchise that struggled. But he, he flourished. So where do you look now you know, towards projecting McCaffrey? Well, I, I like the fact that you're, I mean, you're basically bringing in a college offense that it's having some success. The NFL game is transitioning. Cliff Kingsbury coming into Arizona, he was able to do some, some pretty solid things for his first year as a head coach and a, and a rookie running the offense. So I'm, I'm hopeful for what Matt Rule can do. If we're talking about is there concerns about Christian McCaffrey's workload and will he touch the ball – as many times as last year, yeah, you have to have those concerns because it's new people coming in, but I can't fathom coaches coming into Carolina and saying, well, we should we should make Christian McCaffrey a part-time yeah, and, and running some, back. Some of that's going to be seen with the personnel moves, right? What do they do? They go out and sign another back to share the load, draft a running back, you know, in the middle rounds, it looks like they're trying to get more involved, or is it going to be kind of status quo? I think Christian McCaffrey is pretty safe just based on his talent, his ability, his history, but it is a certainly a red flag. It's, it's a change. Well, it's and Norv Turner was the change that got him to be the absolute every down. I mean, nobody is on the field more than McCaffrey. Well, and, and not to perfectly compare David Johnson to Christian McCaffrey, but you had all of the argument for the college system and the things that would benefit David Johnson in Arizona last year, and at the end of the day, it just wasn't a, a fit from a sure. philosophy standpoint to the strengths of David Johnson. I am not for one minute saying that that is the outcome for the McCaffrey situation, but I am. I have concerns when you have 400-plus touches and a change at the position. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be difficult to not have McCaffrey as the number one pick in the draft based on what he's done. Correct. Um, but there are now concerns with that change. Regarding the the head coach, Ja Rule, the one thing I will just say about him is he, so he, he's coming he's coming from uh, Baylor and Temple before that. And both of those situations, the first year he got there, and granted, obviously totally different. He's inheriting a bad college team at that point. But he went 1-11 – and two and ten in those two first seasons. Then the next season, five hundred. Then the next season, double digit victories turned both programs around. And I think that's how this franchise is viewing the Panthers: is that they're they're willing to strip it down a little bit to build it back up the right way. So looking at twenty twenty, I don't expect this to be just a gangbuster season for the Carolina Panthers. Like, it, we still need to know who the quarterback is, too. Right. That's that's going to make a – They did re-sign Kyle Allen to a one-year deal. So he, he's under contract. Don't think he's the future. Cam Newton should be the quarterback this year. And I think Cam Newton coming back – Look, Mike pointed out this uh, Pat Thorman tweet earlier in the week. Curtis Samuel – So you, you moving the discussion to the passing game and the implications there. Curtis Samuel saw the 10th most deep targets among 70 wide receivers last year. 19% of those targets were catchable. You know, 19%? 19%. I had not seen that. That's not a high number, in case you were. That's, that is it's low impossible. Percentage. That's not a C score. That's not a C grade, a D grade, an F. That's way below. That's 19%. How and, is that possible? And, you know, I, I don't know what to attribute that to outside of, you know, just uh, simply bad, bad quarterback, quarterback play. play. But Curtis Samuel was a preseason darling in the eyes of fantasy football owners last year. And I think it's a fair, it's a fair thing to say that he did not deliver on the expectations. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. But it's pretty pretty tough to overcome. I mean, he was doing his job. If he saw the tenth most deep targets, that means that Curtis Samuel is out there putting himself in an uh, in a position where the quarterback needs to throw him the ball. I mean, it's it's not his fault that nineteen percent were catchable. So 
if if we're just like doing that brief talk about Curtis Samuel, yeah, I'll, if Cam Newton is back and he's back to health, I'll be in on Curtis Samuel again. I think he's a really really good player who who just suffered because of bad quarterback play. Before we move over to the Cleveland Browns and their changes, want to thank today's sponsor, Omaha Steaks. Oh. Now, did you see what I how I did that, guys? Oh man, talking about Cleveland and. Yeah, you know, Omaha, Ohio, oh, and then we're moving over to Omaha. That's oh, so delicious. But let's talk about the meat. OmahaSteaks.com, and you enter the code FOOTBALLERS in the search bar for 68% off the Ultimate Grillers Package. That's $186 value for only $59.99. Order now, and you will get two butchers cut filet mignons trimmed twice to remove all exterior fat. you got to trim those things twice, apparently. Two bold and beefy tops, sirloins, four premium pork chops, four Omaha Steaks burgers, four go- gourmet jumbo franks, four potatoes au gratin, four caramel apple tartlets, an Omaha Steaks signature seasoning packet. Plus, you'll get four more burgers, four more franks for free. Omaha Steaks are the most tender and most flavorful, and you can only get steaks of this quality from America's original butcher. Get this limited time grilling season package and the free burgers and franks for just fifty nine ninety nine. That's a savings of 68%. Stay at home and get ready for grilling season. Go to omahasteaks.com, type footballers in the search bar, and add the ultimate grillers package to your cart today. You think if Nebraska had a football team, they'd be called the called the uh, steaks? The Nebraska steaks? I think it would the be... The Mighty Meats? Yeah, I, well, they would be, they'd like that more than like being... Corn, yeah, you you right? knew Omaha was in Nebraska, right, Mike? Yeah, no, you I didn't make the no. I, I slowly transitioned over to realizing I was uh, speaking okay. out of turn. I okay. was one. I was going to ask if you knew where Omaha was. Yeah. Did, okay. Did you? And you asked yourself that too. Well, I asked Google. <laughs> okay. And then I was like, Yeah, okay. Well, but I was pretty sure it wasn't no, in it, Ohio. I just was the the O. The when, O threw me off. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah all all O cities come from Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> Ohio. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the Cleveland Browns. New head coach, new offensive uh, coordinator uh, this year. Kevin Stefanski coming in, replacing Fred Kitchens. They, br- they, brings in Alex Van Pelt. I mean, Cleveland made a huge mistake, and they acknowledged it when they hired uh, to be their head coach, a guy who didn't have a lot of experience in that realm, was a one-year offensive coordinator. Uh, and, and, they, and they said, you know, we're going to correct our mistake, and we're going to get – Rid of him, and we're going to go hire a guy who doesn't have a lot of experience as a head coach and was an <laughs> offensive coordinator for a year. It was, but, it's so dumb to me. And I'm not saying that Stefanski can't succeed, but it's like bad organizations do bad things. That's – that's Yeah, I, I guess I would – I'd have a much softer stance than your uh, so dumb to me stance. This is a hire to win the way they need to win. Kevin Stefanski is – the type of offense that represents the type of offense that I believe you need to win with Baker Mayfield and the roster that you have, which is completely counterintuitive to what they tried to do last year. They tried to lean on Baker and bring in pass catching weapons and the strength of the offense. The only thing they can move the ball between the twenties was Nick Chubb. I believe that Kevin Stefanski incorrectly gets credit for, having a great running team for the Vikings last year when the credit should really truly be going to their current, and we'll talk about him later, uh, offensive coordinator, Gary Kubiak, who they brought in, who has a long history of... Coops. Oh, the Coops. Uh, And, and of course, Dalvin Cook. I would say those two, you know, were great. But philosophically, you're right. Philosophically, he's uh, on board with running the ball more. They've got Nick Chubb. That could very well be helpful to to the Browns. Um, It's just... I don't know, man. If you're the if you're a franchise like the Cleveland Browns, it's been mired in uh, the dirt. I feel like you need a guy who's got some kind of proven track record. What's so bizarre about Stefanski to me is from 2009 through 2013, he was the assistant quarterback coach. Yes, for Minnesota. Then he moved up the ladder, and then 2017 and 2018, he was the quarterbacks coach. Then he became the OC. But he's like this – is he actually this run-heavy guy? I mean, that's what Zimmer wanted him to do. That's what the head coach thought the philosophy, and that's what the team needs to be. But a coach who has spent most of his time 
coaching up quarterbacks, will he really bring that exact same ground and pound philosophy down to Cleveland? I think I think I believe he will. But I think the reason they hired him is in part because he has that ability to bring Baker along as a professional quarterback. I think the way you're going to get through these next couple of years is leaning on the best piece of your team in Nick Chubb and building the offense around that weapon and letting Baker be more efficient, get him into the red zone, put him in that position where he, he had a lot of success in year one. Ultimately, I don't think this means great things for the Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckhams of the world. I think Beckham can bounce back for fantasy owners respective of last year because last year was awful. Right. And he was dealing with sports hernia and other, you know, excuses. But and so I think bouncing back does not mean necessarily top five performances from Odell on the regular on a regular basis. But do you agree with that? Do you think that Landry is somebody that you're gonna see struggle? You think that Baker is somebody that you're not going to be able to stream very often? I I think you'll be able to stream him just like other quarterbacks. He won't be drafted as a top ten. I, he probably won't even be drafted as a as a QB one heading into actual draft season. But I'm with you that if one of them, if one of the, the pass catchers for Cleveland is still going to contain value, I would lean on it being Odo Beckham Jr. Jarvis Landry needs volume where where Odo Beckham can be the just the efficiency guy. Haven't seen it for a while, but. I don't. Know, I still just. I still believe in the talent of Beckham, so I lean his way. Yeah, it, it is interesting that both of these guys, both the the new head coach and the offensive coordinator Alex Van Pelt, were longtime quarterback coaches. Right. That was so. That is that is at least telling that they want to train Baker up and get him better. But uh, some of the things about Alex Van Pelt, you talk about well, this long history of being a quarterbacks coach. Some of the things, you know, people that have been quarterback coaches. A lot of times they still believe that the running game is more important. Not not always, but in this case, it seems to lean that way. All right, Dallas. Oh, Brooks, how excited are you? Really excited. How's the judge doing with Mr. Mike McCarthy? Really excited. Oh, man, Jason Garrett. It's See you later. Jason, yeah, it's not Jason Garrett. <laughs> yeah. is, that, is that a win? Are you in the win category? Change is good? Yeah. Are you sure this isn't Jason Garrett? Like... <laughs> I think you just kind of zip. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's me. Jason Garrett's wearing a Mike McCarthy suit. Mike, Mac <laughs> Mike McCarthy with the year off becomes the head coach in Dallas. Oh, and now he's he's analytics now. That's what he he's, he, he took the year off. He did. And he was studying. He was working on computers, figuring out how to lie to the the owner to get the head coaching position. Yeah, he talked about analytics like somebody who didn't necessarily commit himself to it yeah him and dave gettleman can gettleman, hold real yeah. great conversations yes. about analytics we do a lot of that stuff there was a lot made this off season when mike mccarthy was making the rounds and i have no doubt had a very very good publicist behind him sending him places and they made the the kind of documentary about how he's rebranding and rebuilding himself up but there was a lot made about the changes the team that he was assembling the uh, the analytics department that he was putting together and um, you know, all of this came to fruition. So there is reason for excitement. We shouldn't just disparage to say it's completely not true. But the reason the jokes come is because, you know, he also said he went, went and watched every single game. That's what I'm and talking about. watched all the film. And then when he's being interviewed right next to Jerry Jones after at the, at the press conference where he was hired as the head coach, and they're saying, what did you see when you were watching every snap? And, and, right. and he flat out goes, oh, I, I didn't watch every snap. I was just telling him. That, you know, because I want to look good or something like I that. I want to get the that, job. I mean, it's like, what? I already got your money. Cal the, 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 the decision here that matters to fantasy owners was the, the decision to keep Kellen Moore. Which is a great decision. And Kellen Moore, last year, the Cowboys ranked sixth in the NFL in points per game, first in total yards. If Zeke, Dak, Amari, that crew is back together with Kellen Moore, I don't think we have a lot to fear if you just replaced – the figurehead Jason Garrett with the figurehead Mike McCarthy. And then this is Mike McCarthy's chance. I mean, Aaron Rodgers got to have kind of the, the first uh, the first punch thrown in the fight of last year, the Packers. They made it into the playoffs. Uh, they were a weird team. Like, where the – They had a great they, record. Were they good? They had a great uh, record. Yeah, yeah win-loss-wise, win they were very good. Yeah, but anyway, so Aaron Rodgers – it's clear that he thinks that the success of the team was 
in the McCarthy era was more to do with Aaron Rodgers. McCarthy, I'm sure, believes it's on him. So let's see what he can do with Dallas. And he's going in. He's coming into a very, very good situation. If McCarthy comes in here to a team last year that had the second most passing yards, the the fifth most passing touchdowns. I mean, he had, he had a top ten offense in passing and rushing. If he comes in and screws it up, then that will be horrifically bad for his legacy. Well, and, and you know, it, it's hard to separate because you can't say. Mo- you can't give all the credit to Aaron Rodgers and all of the blame to Mike McCarthy when they were together. When they were together, they're very good. Right. They had a good offense. Uh, they had good passing Just numbers. Towards, towards the end when it all fell apart. Yeah, so there, I think there's reason for optimism, but Andy's right. This is one of those situations where, uh, you know, especially if Amari Cooper comes back, I don't expect a ton of change here. Keeping the same offensive coordinator, the same group together, that means the same system for the most part. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any fears here about the Cowboys. I'm excited about the Cowboys offense. I'd love to have Zach, uh, Zach, Zeke and Dak. Um, if you combine them though, it is, Zach, yeah, it does it create is, super Zach. Yes. Zach, Zach super Elliott. Zach. Yeah. Um, but I, I would love to have those guys love to have Gallup, love to have a uh, Cooper personally, if he's on the Cowboys. So I'm, I'm uh, very positive towards the Cowboys fantasy, uh, output next year. All right, let's stay in the NFC East, the Giants. New head coach, new offensive coordinator, and a new judge to compete with Judge Giamatti. We've got Judge. I mean, Brooks, you got to be feeling uncomfortable right it's now. The year of the judge, man. Because Very. you were you were on your you know what what does the judge sit on a pedestal? I, what does he sit on up there? A throne of lies. <laughs> I mean, he's, what what is the official term? A bench. Yeah, yeah. I think the bench. So, may I pro- may I approach the bench? Is that yeah, what they that's say? That's fair. Right. That's the thing they say. And yeah. the, the lawyer shows. Yeah. That's right, and which is, those are all documentaries, and you've been alone as Judge Giamatti, on your perch, haughty as can be, very. And, and here comes Joe Judge, head coach of the Giants, and not only that, but you've got Judge Judy in the oh, draft. Oh yeah, Jerry Judy, wide receiver extraordinaire. So this is, I mean, you got to be feeling threatened, uncomfortable. Oh, I'm extremely threatened. Yeah. <laughs> so to get. Yeah. So, Yes. Well, that couldn't set it better. So to get back to the important uh, stuff, I have confirmed that the judge generally sits behind a raised desk known as the bench. That's yeah. right. We did it. We That's right. are we. so oh, but smart. But isn't the actual Judge Judy retiring? That's true. Oh, so yes. one, That's one judge one. goes away. That's well, because there yeah. can only be one. Yeah. That's a pivot. Yeah. She's there becoming is. a wide receiver in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> That's accurate. Okay, getting into the Giants. Joe Judge, the new head coach, replacing Pat Shermer. He was the wide receiver and special teams coach for the Patriots in 2019. He's got some of that Belichick cologne dripping. Mm. Yeah. Um, M- many have tried with, yeah. the, with the Belichick cologne, and it's really more like an old man musk where you're like it, – It doesn't fit everybody. No. Yeah, because if the younger guy goes out with the old man musk, that's not really the – Like, is, is that cool I water? I smell like my dad. <laughs> I th- you know, if you, you smell look like at- cognac and cigars. That's right. <laughs> if you look at those two guys, Sean McVay and Bill Belichick, one of them you just assume smells real good. <laughs> and the other you're like, I'm gonna guess he doesn't smell Oh come on. Very- I'm no I'm just look, I'm just saying that. But the the reality is <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 look, I'm just saying that. Look, I'm just saying that. that that's, that's the defense? You uh, get to say whatever you want. I said then. no offense. And then you said, look, no, look, no, hold on. Hold look, your horses. Look, I'm just saying that. Yeah. Yeah, we know. <laughs> so, um, oh I God. didn't know that was a, a real defense Histi- that I could use. You can use it in a court of law. Yeah. Um, historically, the coaching tree from Bill Belichick has been a fail pile. There are a handful of coaches that have succeeded for a while. Uh, I, I mean, would you consider Romeo Cornell yes. to be a guy who succeeded for More a More success than failure, but not always as a head coach, obviously. Obviously, just as Bill, a coordinator. O- Bill O'Brien, uh, he, I would say he's, yeah, no, he's he's the biggest success, no, but right? You, yeah, yes. Bill O'Brien's a success. Matt Patricia hasn't been able to do it yet. But there are like 50 guys who have been hired from his right. staff. Vrabel. Vrabel's a huge success. Oh, he is the biggest success now already. Um, but th- there are so many people that have come from that system and and failed. And it's so funny. I was uh, researching this, and I'm looking up, uh, reading on why they hired him. And it w- if you remember back to the time that they hired him, it looked like they were going to get Ja Rule. 
It looked for right. sure like that was going to happen, and then the Carolina Panthers came and offered this really long contract. Dave Gettleman's not hip enough. He took for that, ja Rule, and then like though. immediately they like almost before Ja Rule was announced oh as gosh. the head coach for the Carolina Panthers, they're like Joe Judge is ours. Like we, uh, Joe mm. Judge is our head coach. Right. And when I was reading these quotes, here's a quote from uh, the Giants co-owner John Mara uh, about uh, hiring him, and he said, "Well, uh, you know." We have conversations around the office about bright young coaches around the league, and Judge's name came up a few times. Um, Good enough for me? Yeah, well, here's here's the thing. So he, he, he goes on and he says, again, when I saw that he left Alabama, he eventually ended up on the New England staff. I said, wait a second. There has to be something to this guy if he's from Alabama. That makes sense. Because you've got Nick Saban. Saban comes from the Belichick tree. Exactly. Right. And, and, and Bill Belichick. But it, that, I guess it just brings fear to me that, like, Wait, is that the there, reason? They, this is a this is a hire by association, right? Versus a hire by what he's. Well, but I mean, if you're associated with those two guys, you are you are being successful. Like Saban and Belichick aren't going to have you around if you're. A, Isn't a Adam bum. Adam Gaze through the Saban tree in some capacity? I don't remember that. I, well, it's a, a, it's a long tree to track uh, to trace yes. down, but nevertheless, Joe Judge is the new head coach. We we have no way to know his tendencies. He you know he was a uh, special teams coach for the Patriots and uh, wide receiver coach this last year in 2019 for the Patriots. He doesn't have a history of calling plays or running offenses. Now there is that's a why long, you brought in Jason Garrett. There's baby. a long history of Jason <laughs> Garrett who was uh, hired. Oh yeah, and it doesn't that seem Garrett's had a, a many many successful seasons. Yes, statistically he has. as an offense. He has the ability, at least had the ability, kind of like McCarthy, to put up some big seasons as a coordinator. It's just a matter of, you know, he feels like such a retread situation, and it's going to feel, I'm assuming to you, Judge, so strange to see him after, what, 12 years in Dallas to be on the other side? Longer than that? I'll be happy to see him clapping over there on that sideline. Oh, wow. Hopefully he's not clapping. Otherwise, maybe you're he on the claps. wrong no, end he, of it. He'll be clapping. He'll no be, matter what. He claps when they lose. Yeah, he always claps. Uh, defense inter- mechanism. Interception. Okay, we're clapping. Yep. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, prospects for these players. I mean, obviously, you've got a guy who's been using Zeke in a great way for fantasy who now has Saquon. Right. So I don't think there's any fears there. The no. real question is can he develop um, – Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones into something special. And, you know, we've never, we've never ever uh, talked about giving credit at all to the, you know, emergence of Dak Prescott. Do, is there something, does Jason Garrett deserve some credit for it's, taking it's a fair a, point? I think so. I think he does. And, and he's taken so much flack in the media for the past few years. But, you know, the majority of the time that he was either the offensive coordinator or the head coach. For Dallas, he was a top half team in terms of offensive points per game. I mean, last year they were sixth, and yeah, you give a lot of the credit to Kellen Moore, but you know he was a part of that offense, and and years previously he had had a lot of success. So it's it's pretty wild. Tony Romo was undrafted. Is, am I remembering that correctly? Uh, un- I thought he was like a sixth round, but yeah, he's he's either undrafted or very late. But the that fact that. that Jason Garrett had the he's six- either drafted or undrafted. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> He's very late or undrafted. He was He was an undrafted free agent. Okay. Yeah, I told you. <laughs> I appreciate just it. Just saying that. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm just I saying. just said it. I just I said it. <laughs> but the, the success he had with an undrafted quarterback and then and and Dak who was a, a fourth round pick. If I'm remember, I'm everything I'm pulling everything from the top of my head here, but that's pretty amazing to have that team where and he didn't have a top 10 draft pick at the quarterback position. Yeah. Very and, interesting. And they're a team that I think, you know, it's going to come with the development of Daniel Jones, and that offense has the ability to move. We saw it at times last year. It right. just wasn't consistent. I think there there should be some optimism there, but we don't know a lot about what Joe Judge is going to do there. We know about Jason Garrett. And we get to talk about another NFC East team, the Washington Redskins. Ron Rivera replacing Jay Gruden. Brings in a new offensive coordinator, Scott Turner. Uh, how do you feel about this move? I mean, I know that we are Ron Rivera fans in concept, or at least Jason and I are pretty big fans of him as the head coach of this team. But how do you feel about this move? Yeah, I, I mean, we. I guess I'll I'll echo because I believe Mike is has a difference of opinion on what we believe in Rivera. I think Rivera is a very good head coach. 
um, you know, as as far as you know, a leader, a CEO um, in in that role. Some of these head coaches, like Cliff Kingsbury, they come in, they basically run half the team. And but Ron Rivera is a guy that is respected by all of his teammates, and I think he's a strong, stable force, which a team that is not a very well run organization like the Redskins could use. This is what you know. If I was the Browns, I'm trying to get my team to to the middle <laughs> you know like I'm not I'm you know that's kind of where I want to get and Ron Rivera could get you there um offensively uh you've got Scott Turner coming over who was with him um, in Carolina in, in 2019 Car in Carolina this is really going to uh, you know I think come down to Haskins more than the coaching right and, and a lot of these we've looked back we've talked for years and years and years about uh, the success of some of these coordinators and the failures of some of these coordinators. And if you really look at who their quarterback was, you can find a trend as to whether they were successful or not based on did they have a good one. And, and you know, that's that's up to, you know, Haskins. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. I just uh, – Rivera, I mean, he's – Is it too vanilla for you? It is very vanilla. I mean, he's a defensive guy. Like he was a he was a DC before he was the head coach. But you have to look at what is the actual success of Ron Rivera. Nine years as a coach in Carolina, three winning seasons. Like I think we can all agree that three out of nine. If you've only have three winning seasons, that's bad. Now one of them was a great year. I get it. They, they were Super Bowl. They, they were in the Super Bowl. They were very close to becoming the the national champions, but national champions, really? Well, what would you call that? Super Bowl champions? Okay, well, of, but of the nation? Okay, I, it's just what you call the college winner. So it was a fair. Super, okay, I, just, I was just what popped into my head is people saying like, "Oh, it's the international." Okay, so you're like, no, yeah, I, 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 I didn't want to go to that level. I didn't want to crown them that that large. Hey, you said it. But three out of nine, hey, uh, you're just saying. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just said it. But three out of nine is is not. Good. No, it's not. That's good. not good. But he could get you back to the middle. And yeah, and that's why when you brought up the point of can Rivera get you to the middle? Okay, if if that's where your eyes are set, that we're trying to get to the middle. You, you, okay, yeah, you, I mean, you got a guy who can get you there. We he, go ahead. He took over a team that was what two and fourteen, and a couple years later had three years in a row of winning the division. So I. Yeah, I mean, he, he might not be the best out in the world, but he was near the best that was out there available. Let's move on to the Bears. Bears brought in a new offensive coordinator. The Mark Helfrich experiment is over, but I'm not sure that this is the hire you wanted to make. Bill Lazor. I am so sorry. I mean, things can change quickly. The defense can do a lot in the NFL, but the Bears feel like that team that is just heading towards collapse. Because you're de you're going to be dealing with a quarterback controversy situation if you if you sign someone like Andy Dalton to sit behind Mitch Trubisky, which is somebody that Bill Lazor, taking over at offensive coordinator, is familiar with, and you know you you run into some trouble at the top of the season with what Matt Nagy has done. This would be a another year going backwards after that great debut. I just worry a little bit about this hire and bringing him in and what you're going to get. This is a an offensive coordinator, when you look at his time as the OC in Miami and Cincinnati, four years, he's never been in the top ten in any category as an offensive coordinator. We're talking well, what about, about rushing yards. No, not rushing yards. What about passing yards? No. How about just either of those touchdowns? They lucked into some touchdowns? No touchdowns. Total scoring? No, no, no points either. Okay. No, not, nothing in any category, any year, showing you that you should be optimistic because of Bill Lazor. Let's put it that way. There are things that can happen that can bring the Allen Robinson hype or, you know, whatever, David Montgomery hype to fruition this offseason. But I would not put that into Bill Lazor's. There's, he's not the causation for that. Sure, but, but how much will Bill Lazor be really changing things? I mean, Matt Nagy, right. it, Matt Nagy's the offensive mind. He'll be the one, you know, more in control of that type of stuff. But yeah, there, I can't but think that of But that doesn't word. necessarily make me feel better okay. after last year. <laughs> That's fair. So that that's my concern is that we haven't seen this moving forward in Chicago. I can't think of the word. There's a word that's like a, a, a fake 
uh, spokesperson, like a not scapegoat, but the, like a figurehead. Yes, or a, yes, or a yes. Lame like, duck, or the, I mean, that's basically what I feel like Bill Lazor is. It was you just, got that out of fake spokesperson. He, we've known that's each other impressive. for a long yeah. time. There you go. Um, but he's just like this ah Farfanugan. <laughs> that's what you meant. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> it, you know, is it, really not the guy that's running things. He's. I feel like, but that's what you you should have brought someone in to potentially run things. But Matt Nagy wants to prove himself still. He, I, you know, I don't think he... So from one scapegoat to another, hell frick to laser? Exactly right. That's so exactly it, what it is. Okay. And it, and it's not going to work out well unless they fix the quarterback position. I mean, I don't believe that Matt Nagy is a bad offensive mind. I really don't. Sometimes he definitely gets too cute. But I think if he had a quarterback that could execute some of these really cute things, you'd be like, he's a genius and he doesn't. He doesn't have that. Right. So, you know, it's one of those, can someone come in behind him, a Bridgewater or a Dalton, and compete and become this year's Ryan Tannehill? And then, okay, if that happens, Bill Lazor was a good hire. I think you're probably right about that. But he won't get the credit. Nagy will get the credit. He'll right. Oh, yeah. he'll, he'll, oh, get yeah. the, he'll get the blame. Yes. All right, the Broncos, new offensive coordinator, Pat Shermer. You guys feel like Pat Shermer got a – Raw deal in New York, opportunity-wise, or was it time to move on for both parties? I, I think it was a little bit too soon that you're gonna. Uh, Shermer was there what two, two years? years, 2018, yeah. 2019. To go from the very end of Eli Manning's career, Eli Manning's career, and then you're you give him the the new franchise quarterback and don't really give him a shot. It, yeah, it I think it was seem a little bit rough. I would say it was too early to judge. Because yeah, he, yeah, got he, could, yeah. he got replaced I was, by a I was judge. A big fan. That was crickets, but I was a big fan of that one. Yeah. That was he got it was, replaced it was by okay. Joe Judge. It was, it was all right. too early to judge. It's March. I mean <laughs> Judge was the verb. It's right. a good joke for Look, March. Yeah. I I've never heard a joke and then it was funnier like the second time I heard it. Until but, right but now. But that just happened. This that you're so I blame, a little bit better? I blame your delivery the first one, because the second time though it was much better. All right. Okay. Maybe maybe go for go for a third? It was too early <laughs> to judge. No, number two was the best. Yeah, okay, yeah, number two. two we peaked. It was a mountain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, it is interesting when you look at Pat Shermer. He's had a lot of success with young tight ends. You look at uh, young Zach Ertz, Brent Selleck. Is this an opportunity? He was, he was the offensive coordinator, I believe, during Foles' magic season. Does Shermer mean good things for Noah Fant and his potential maturity? You never it's, see these rookies do it in year one. but I, I think Shermer is a great hire here. He he w seemed a little over his head as as a head coach for the, the second time, um, but he's he's been a very good, above-average offensive coordinator in the past. There's a reason he's gotten multiple head coaching gigs. It's because what he's been able to do with offense is now you have a young offense here with a Cortland Sutton and a Drew Locke and a Noah Fant and you got pieces to put together and now he doesn't have to be the CEO the guy running everything front to back in a major market uh, you could say well you know he had this, these young pieces these Saquons and Evan Ingrams and those pieces and he didn't get it done with the Giants but I do believe you know we've talked about certain guys that are that have success as offensive coordinators or, or defensive coordinators and not so much as head coaches this is one of those guys that I think is a good hire for, for the Broncos. All right, Jacksonville's new offensive coordinator is Jay Gruden, replacing John DiFilippo. I like Jay Gruden overall. I think he did about as much as he could do with what he was given, with the level of control he was allowed to have in Washington. I can't wait for this discussion about Ron Rivera in like five years. From 2014 to 2019. Just, just copy it. Copy, paste. Did the best with what he had, but yep. that still didn't mean much. Yep. So, you know, he, he was handed some difficult situations, the Alex Smith injury, the rise and fall of Robert Griffin, Ugh. the bumbling of the Kirk Cousins that, you know, I don't think really fell a lot on Jay Gruden. So what do you think of his addition here in Jacksonville? We know there'll be a quarterback battle, Foles, Gardner. We saw Gardner have some success. It wasn't uh, – consistent necessarily but there were definitely some flashes dj chark and company i i like the hire for jacksonville i think gruden is is a good offensive mind and, and he he can he can get things out of a quarterback i mean frustratingly he couldn't get anything out of haskins there uh in company but 
I think he is. Uh, I think it's a good hire, especially because it seems like they will be moving forward with uh, with Gardner. That's my assumption, anyways. Do you guys think it'll be Foles or Gardner? No, it, it'll be. I, I have every expectation that it'll be Gardner. Um, you know, there's rumors that they've tried to shop him. They're going to have both there. There will be a competition. Yeah, I, I think it'll be a fair competition. I don't I, think. I don't think Jay is wanting the younger guy necessarily. If Foles outperforms him. I agree with that completely. I I do think that Foles is such a good backup, <laughs> um, and that's where he will excel. Well, he the will most. Ex he excels technically as a backup that then comes in and yes. leads you to greatness. That's why you need him as a backup. Exactly. So for the W's down the road. Yep. Step one, backup. Step two, I'm sorry, Gardner, but something. <laughs> and then step three, Super Bowl. Yeah, th this is. I you know I don't see this as a major upgrade or downgrade here. John D. Filippo's you know, been the hot commodity who's thrown the ball too much and then needs to run the ball more and then runs too much and yada, yada. Jay Gruden He's is a little bit. He's the not commodity now. If that's right. Two years, uh, two firings. Two firings in two years, but also two hirings in two years. So He's doing it right. He's Half full. Reminds me of Brooks. We fire him twice a day. <laughs> hire him back. That's Here right. I am. Here he is. Just keep showing uh, up. Brooks, we're going to need to talk. Stop that paycheck. When we're done. Someone. All right, Los Angeles, the Chargers, uh, Shane Steichen took over for Wisenhunt after week eight. Their passing offense improved in total net yards per game, passing yards per game, passing yards per attempt. Rushing offense improved. We just talked about the Eckler signing. Uh, confident with Steichen moving forward? Yeah, this was a really cool – I mean, it's always nice when you can see. You, you go, okay, same team, same personnel, same roster, same quarterback – Different coordinator halfway through the season. I believe it was at week eight, so half of the season with each one, and and he was better than Ken Wisenhunt. So, therefore, this seems like an upgrade, but it's not really going to make a difference until we know who the quarterback is. For You can't just say, well, the, the now the Chargers are better this year. They lost their quarterback. If it's Tyrod Taylor, numbers are going to be down. The counting stats for fantasy football are going to be down across the board. But, uh, you know, in general – think he was an upgrade over Ken Winston Hunt. Yeah, it kind of feels a little bit like, I mean, Freddie Kitchens kind of did this last year. He was given a head coaching position after it, but he was instrumental in the second half resurgence of the B Browns offense. Uh, Sykin did that in Los Angeles, but like you said, I mean, is it Tyrod Taylor? Is it a rookie? Is it someone in that top 10 of the NFL draft coming up? I don't know. Let's talk about the Rams. New offensive coordinator, bringing him in. Sure. Um. Is Sean McVay actually going to give up play calling duties at all? He said he's not sure, and I take that to mean nope. <laughs> that's I mean that's I I I, don't, I think Sean McVay will continue to call the plays. Uh, if he gives it up, then great. He's trying to be more of the CEO, less of the uh, offensive coordinator. Obviously, he did not have an offensive coordinator. Uh, he w has been that, so I I think it's a good move to bring someone in to help. But I still believe this will be McVeigh's offense. He's not going to just completely turn it over and have it be someone else's uh, offense and to that, run. And that's Kevin O'Connell that's taking either the right the helping role or has an opportunity to maybe call some plays over time. It was with the Browns, 49ers, Redskins. Ironically, he replaced Sean McVeigh uh, in Washington. In Washington, yeah. So they were never on the same staff, though. Hmm. He just when McVeigh got hired, he he was the replacement. Yeah, I think McVeigh keeps keeps that role for sure, but we'll see. Has someone to hand it off to if he needs to. And then Miami bringing in Chan Gailey. This one is interesting. I love it. This one is I is love it. Really interesting. Chan Gailey, uh, he vanished for a few years, <clears throat> but what we do have is we have a pretty sizable sample of Chan Gailey running his offense with Ryan Fitzpatrick. You have two different places that they were together. You had him up in Buffalo. Then you had uh, it, it, uh, in New York running things for the Jets. And especially that Jets run, Ryan Fitzpatrick had a Fitz magical year there where Brandon Marshall was a top five guy. Eric Decker was just outside being a wide receiver one. Do the you remember they had – I don't know if you guys know this statistic. Those two guys that year – had over three hundred targets. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> That's when when that was because they were the entire offense. I mean, they didn't. Fitzpatrick didn't throw it to anybody else. But I, I'm with Andy. I like this. I, I have some optimism here. Yes, we all fully expect Miami to grab a, a rookie in the draft. Maybe they get Tua. But 
at least we should start out the year with with some sweet fantasy production. Ryan Fitzpatrick doing it again. Yeah, I think that they you, you could see some improvement quickly in Miami, just from a wins and losses perspective. They got 14 draft picks coming into this year. They obviously performed well at the back end of the year, the devastating defeat of the Patriots that cost them the bye. Chan Gailey, Mike Clay uh, tweeted about how heavy he was on four wide receiver sets the last time we saw him, 2015-2016. He was running four wide receiver sets 51% of the time, 46% of the time. Three wide receiver sets, 89, 86% of the time. He's an old but he's an old guy, but he, he likes is. to he likes to wing it. And when you have a quarterback like that, put yourself in that position where you can. Well, and it speaks to using the personnel because yeah, he was crazy four wide receiver set, but I if you remember back to those teams with the Jets, they they didn't have a tight end. I mean, it was uh, right. Jeff Cumberland was their leading tight end. And so he took the pieces that he had. So it's going to be interesting with Gasicki because he is one of the That's Doctor Strange, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, I missed. Something. I don't understand the reference. What? I'm just agreeing, hoping I, that I, I I think it was a Cumberbatch joke. Oh, oh. I, I'm acting like as though I didn't make the joke, yeah. and I am investigating who did. <laughs> oh, I will get back to you when Brooks? I fi did when Brooks I figure out who actually made it. I will let you know. Wow. It was in my ear. Brooks told me to say it. Yeah. Brooks, you're fired. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> right. Cumberbatch joke. Oh, man. From Cumberland. Oh. It's not good. It's March, though. It's good for March. That's what. They, <laughs> He's just you, saying. You don't compare this show in March just to this it. show in August. Okay? <laughs> yeah. We That's are important. In, we the, are in off season. We're in the form. off season. We're not even. We're like working out separately. We're not even at, even at the team <laughs> facility right now. I, I think the biggest takeaway is essentially. Chan Gailey has worked with Ryan Fitzpatrick. It's clear that he's going to be the starter because they're bringing him in, and he's going to let him fly. He's going to let him go. Nuts. He won't the, clip his wings. The first season that he had, you know, with him with the Jets, it was four thousand yards, thirty-one touchdowns, fifteen interceptions, and you know was was great. So th this is going to be fun. I'm excited for the Dolphins, and they didn't have a running game to speak of then. I think it was like Chris Ivory. Well, but Ivory and Bilal Powell both had fantasy success under well, and under it, they Daly. Threw to Bilal Powell a right. lot. All right, in Minnesota, Stefanski, he's out. New head coach of the Browns, Gary Kubiak. Kubes, Kubes is back. He's been in the National Football League forty nine years. He's so good, <laughs> and he should be a head coach of a National Football League team. I believe it. He stepped down. Uh, years ago but he's he he's phenomenal and when you know when you look at the history of guys that have been in the league for a long time usually you got some good some bad some but when you look at his history as in the running game yes he's just phenomenal his teams run the ball well when you add to the fact that you've got Dalvin Cook you saw what Coops coming in this last year did with the Vikings running game I am uh you know Dalvin Cook's locked in as a top five guy to me in, in my rankings for next year. Yeah. Somebody asked on Twitter, would they trade Dalvin Cook for the 105? I was like, no, you don't do that. Mm, yeah. What do you think? No, I would. Even I, in this draft class, not, not yeah, for the 105. I think I'll take Dalvin Cook. I mean, we, we just talked about having the known commodity. I don't think I veteran. would. I don't think I would trade Dalvin Cook for the 101. I mean, Jonathan Taylor looks great. Maybe he goes somewhere great and maybe he is better. But what D Dalvin Cooks? What what more do you want than a guy who's already done it, proven it? He's got the you know the role. He's got coobs. DeAndre Swift takes offense to you always presuming Jonathan Taylor's the number one pick. Sure, look if if uh, Swift goes to the Chiefs, that will be changed. <laughs> <laughs> he will be my one on one. What about Thielen and Diggs? The implications for them under Kubiak? Do you? I mean, you see more of what you saw last year, where the targets were were way down from twenty eighteen. Yeah, I, 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 is Diggs I, even going to be there? Oh, I don't know. We had that photo going around the interwebs. That's such an Antonio Brown thing to do. He, he, he yeah, but it's good because it's the Arizona Cardinals. There's a photo of him working out in a Cardinals shirt because he wants. Why what? would you do that? He would do that because he wants to go to the Cardinals. That's what AB would do. He's like, oh, I want to come play with Brady, so I'm going to warm up in a Patriots shirt. That's such an AB type of thing to do. Uh, Mr. Diggs. And all he does is tweet in <laughs> four, on, four hold words. Hold on, hold on. Jason's talking uh, to uh, Mr. Diggs, you are welcome here <laughs> in Arizona. 
<laughs> with open arms. And uh, look, Coobs, I know you want to run the ball well. Can we interest you in some David Johnson? <laughs> oh, no. I'm just saying we're going to have to make some trade. I just said it. I just I'm not <laughs> saying, but I just said it. Philadelphia, no more offensive coordinator. Uh, no one's replacing Mike Grow. They determined that nothing was better than Mike Grow. <laughs> That's not good. Uh, they're not going <laughs> to utilize the offensive coordinator title. Oh, uh, right then. I mean, it's definitely cheaper. Nothing is cheaper than something. Now, does does Peterson then just like does he absorb that salary? Probably. Look, man, if I was a head coach. <laughs> I would have Andy Reid been no absorbing OC. salaries for a long time. Uh, no defensive coordinator. It would just be me. I'd be stressed, yes. but I'd be rich. Oh, it would be it would be a one year ride, but I would make make fifty million dollars. Yeah, you know this is this is one of the interesting situations where ever since the Super Bowl title and the Doug Peterson could do no wrong, it has been a slippery slide down the hill from there, and I, I think he's going to have. Real question: If he doesn't get the team performing well this season, especially on offense, You're talking about the playoff team. Yeah, I, I'm, I, the, no, I, I, I don't disagree. That, I don't disagree with you. Did they have a above five hundred record and make the playoffs? I don't. Well, I didn't either here nor there. It was it was the NFC uh, least. Oh. I, I, remember, I saw the future. I told you they get to the playoffs. Hmm. I think it was a Super Bowl that you saw. Yeah, they were nine and seven. Oh, all right. Um, you know, I, but. You know, since really Frank Reich left, it's like, who, you know, do, have you looked at Doug Peterson the same as in this great offensive just genius? It, it hasn't felt that way. So it's interesting to me. There's I'm, been so many injuries, I think, that people look to. Yeah. and, and or at least that's what I look to. Well, and it's true. I mean, last year they, they lost all their wide receivers. They lost their running backs at times. Tight ends at times. Yeah, it was it was not good. But I feel... I feel like he could use another guy. I mean, he he's shown well when he has a good coordinator with him. So it's just surprising to me that. But he was he was much he was like McVay. I mean, the, the figurehead situation where he was calling a lot of the plays in the offense, and you just talked about it with Nagy, and you know maybe it was just not worth doing the dance of having somebody else to powwow with. I I, I guess it's good in the sense that if you can't find the right person. It would be better if you if I was Doug Peterson and I believe in my skill set. If I can't find the person that I'm confident is exactly who I want to work with and make things better, then maybe he's doing the right thing. Yeah. So are you saying we don't need a producer? <laughs> oh, wow, oh, man. man. Well, we're gonna have to figure out if he comes in tomorrow. Welcome back, by the way. I'll see you tomorrow. All right. <laughs> right we figured it out. I'm just joking. I love you. You're the, the number one judge in my heart, Brooks. All right, we want to thank Pristine Auction today. A Todd Gurley signed jersey yesterday sold on pristineauction.com for $55.90. Check out their hundreds of daily sports memorabilia auctions. And that would be $45 if you use the promo code BALLERS as a new registration because you get $10 credit towards one of these type of auctions. Oh, my gosh, your math is outlandishly good this time of year. Yeah. Your March math is awesome. Ten dollars off. March, March Madness. Yeah. Uh, we we all were right. all we thinking it. Shut this you down. You said it Quit. though. Pristineauction.com. Use the code Ballers. The we'll, doctor's We'll strange. be back with another show. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Eat it. See you next week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com. And follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers.